out. We're going to go Mark chapter 15 tonight. But as I was thinking about uh, where we're at in the scripture, this is actually a great setting for, uh, I think, what the Holy Spirit was already preparing in my heart. Because uh, when I read earlier from the call of worship from Jeremiah, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He was uh, the one who... Maybe there might have been one person who was converted in his ministry to follow the Lord. Everybody else, uh, that's the reason he was called the weeping prophet, because he stood alone. He, he prophesied and he taught the people to turn back to God and their ways. And uh, as I was thinking about even King David at one point, he was the only one. He was anointed king. He was called to the country. Uh, and at, at that point, he was um, you know, being chased by King Saul because Saul was threatened by him and he was alone. And uh, at that point of no return, when the only friend he had really was Jonathan, uh, God brought mighty men beside him to help carry the weight to uh, fulfill the ministry in his life. And so as I was thinking about this, when you think about, you know, we're in a small group tonight, but ultimately there's times when we don't have strength in numbers, or that our faith is tested because uh, of things that are going around and outside of us and things that are going on in circumstances. Our faith gets tested and we're not always with other people to encourage us. We feel alone. And tonight when we think about Jesus going to the cross, um, he's already, his disciples have already been scattered. There's no one left to stand beside him to walk him through this. And so he's feeling the weight of the ministry. He's feeling the weight of the call of what he has to do. And it's all on his shoulders all by himself. And so as we pick it up in chapter 15 tonight, uh, if you remember... And Jesus was falsely trialed. He went to uh, this kangaroo-style court that was just made up of people who wanted to um, kill Jesus rather than get to justice. And uh, they could not convict him. They brought him before Pilate, and they could not bring up real charges. So Pilate said, you know what? I'm fearing the people, and what I want to do is put Jesus up as a bargaining uh, block for the people to choose whether you're going to pick Barabbas or Jesus. And the blood of Jesus was demanded to be spilled by the crowd rather than released. And now the Romans, um, this most, the most brutal and perfect executioners of all time, are going to joy, joyfully crucify Jesus in this chapter. And now Barabbas has been set free, and Jesus is in the hands of the Roman soldiers. And I just want to give a little warning. This is a disturbing chapter. chapter. It's hard to get through uh, because... You know, maybe if you don't know the Lord yet and it's new to you, uh, it doesn't mean so much. But as I get older and older and older in Him and the Lord, every time I go back and I read the crucifixion, it weighs on me even more and more um, just what He went through. So it's a little bit of a disturbing chapter uh, because this kind of evil was unleashed upon our Savior. Um, but it was for us to see something very important that when the Bible says He took our place, we actually understand what he endured to take our place in this. So let's begin in verse 16 together. Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. So they took him into Pilate's house. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his own clothes on back on him. And they led him out to crucify him. So we have this vicious opening scene to uh, after the court appearance. And it's this vicious encounter with the soldiers. And in the Greek here, uh, in verse 19, uh, depending on what version you have, the Greek is, uh, the, the verbs they use is actually, it's imperfect and it's tense. So uh, and if the ESV is more up to date, but the King James and the New King James don't hit it as hard. But what they're telling us here is they were continuously hitting him and continuously spitting on him. And it's important to understand that the entire Roman battalion that was stationed there in verse 16 was doing this to Jesus over and over and over again. It was to begin the crucifixion process, but also to show us exactly what evil man thinks of God's rule. They don't want God to rule them, do they? They don't want his leadership. They want to do what they want to be, you know, okay and comfortable in their sin and what they're doing. And so they rebel against him. So it's a, it's a picture of what God, uh, when he says, I love you, and man says, you know what, I don't want anything to do with you. 
So I want to look at a couple things. Look at the, the insulting scarlet robe that they talked about. So it's just an imitation. What a king should have been wearing were imperial purple kingly robes. And they're taking off this scarlet robe, which was probably uh, one of the soldiers that has been worn in battle and it's probably got bloodstains already on it. It's starting to wear out. Um, but they put this on Jesus in mockery of him. And they put upon him his, on his head a crown. And it was laced with rubies. But spiritually, it was because it was laced with his great drops of blood that there was rubies all around his crown. The soldiers paid him homage, but the only homage they really gave him was their filthy spit that ran down his face at this time. This is a horrific look. In their final mockery, they bow on their knees and they shout out, Hell, King of the Jews. He was not their king. They rejected him. But like every victim of the crucifixion now, uh, when they would crucify someone, the person that was being crucified would have to carry their own cross. And what that means is they would have to carry the cross beam itself. And this thing weighed anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds. The, the complete cross would weigh 300 pounds altogether. But typically the victim would be stripped naked and they would be tied to this beam. And they would have to carry that from wherever the beating or the flogging just happened to the cross. And the, what Scripture describes to us is they had to go out of the city. So if you can imagine what Jesus is looking at uh, physically is in the distance is this upright vertical piece that's already stationary in the ground. This is what the, the criminal will be facing as they carry their cross beam from wherever this, you know, the, the verdict has been passed, the beating has happened, and now they have to carry it to the cross. And so it would be looming in the distance. And it would be this reminder that this is the point. These are my final steps, that this is the end point for my life. This is where my life is going to end now after this long walk. But Jesus had already been beaten so differently than everyone else. A whole battalion came in. That that beating that morning, he had already lost an enormous amount of blood. He was already weak physically. And the Romans, they wanted to keep him alive. And this is what they did in verse 21. They wanted him to get to the cross. So in verse 21 it says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. So, you know... The Romans could have picked anybody. They could have picked another Jewish person and said, Hey, I want you to carry the cross for Jesus. But um, instead, what happened, they were afraid that this would cause an uproar because it's the Jewish people who want Jesus dead. And so uh, instead of you know, enlisting the help of a Jewish person, they find a stranger, this someone who lives 800 miles away from northern Africa, who happens to be there for Passover, to come carry his cross and say, he's already so weakened from what we've done to him that most likely just carrying that cross physically would kill him. But we want him to be crucified. You know, we don't know much about Simon. This is a, a, he's a very little blip in the, in the scripture, but, you know, after carrying the cross of Christ and following Jesus up the hill to Calvary and being beside him, it had impacted his life in such a way that we hear later on in Acts chapter, uh, or Romans uh, 16, 13, that his son Rufus actually becomes a believer. So this had affected him so much that Simon, he literally understood when Jesus says, I want you to pick up your cross and follow me, he got to experience what that was like. And you know what it means when we pick up our cross isn't that uh, it's not about our strength or our ability to become a better Christian in ourselves, but it's about letting what Jesus did for us in the cross affect us completely. It changes us. We let the truth change us. In verse 22, it goes on to say, And they brought him to the place called Golgotha. Um, it's just the, the Latin word for Calvary, which means the place of a, of a, of a skull. So uh, it would have been customary for that criminal that was carrying that cross beam. Jesus is now, uh, his cross beam is carried by Simon. But it would have been customary that a centurion on horseback would lead him to the place of death. The, the leader of the executioner team would do this. And what they would also do is, for the criminal, they would enlist a herald.
herald, and a herald would be the same word that we use for evangelist today, someone who would proclaim the news. Unfortunately, though, uh, we get to herald the news of the gospel, but in Jesus' case, they were uh, heralding uh, the criminal accusations. And so they would have been saying things like, this is the king of the Jews who's leading the insurrection against Rome, and this is his price to pay for being a traitor to the country. But it was all false accusations. Verse 23 goes on to say, as they led him out, And they offered him wine and mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. Now, they had offered Jesus this wine mixed with myrrh. And just to break it down in our terms, this would be a narcotic or a painkiller. And what they would do is uh, they started this practice in Proverbs that when uh, you know Jewish people were going through these type of, of perils, uh, they would offer this and kind of, you know, care of them just to give them some relief from the pain. But Jesus refuses it. And the only reason I can think of this is, you know, he, he wants to have all and he must have all of his faculties to be able to handle what's going on, what he's dealing with, not only physically, but spiritually on the cross and what's coming next to accomplish it. He had to be in full control of what he was thinking and understanding. Now, there's two main reasons, though, uh, when you think of suffering, that Jesus had to suffer this way. And the first one is it was necessary for the completion of atonement. And so that's a big Christian word for atonement. Uh, but basically, if you can understand that something was broken between God and man, we call it reconciliation, when God put it back together through Jesus for mankind. So he had to complete that. That, that. that process had to be totally fulfilled. And so suffering must have been part of that. The second thing was Jesus had to suffer to complete his character. Now this is, this is hard to understand. He had to complete his character as his new role as the high priest who would sympathize with us. He had to go through everything. Every blow that he took, every nail in his hand, everything that went into his feet, his side, he had to complete that so that he could become that high priest for us on our behalf between us and God the Father. Uh, that he would know how to assist those who actually go through all these suffering. How can you have a friend that sticks closer to you than a brother who understands suffering unless they've been through it? Then he can walk us through it as a faithful high priest. Verse 25 goes on to say, And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. So Jesus, you know... He is the king of the Jews. He's, he's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. So that was a rightful title. Uh, but in this sense, what they're doing is they're mocking Jesus. Not because they're thinking he is the king of Jews, but this is the charge. This is the criminal accusation that is hanging above his head on the cross. You can see in the background behind me that wooden sign above him. And because it was a charge that he was trying to lead an insurrection against Rome, he was trying to overthrow the ruler of Rome, which would have been Caesar. And Jesus stands wrongfully accused, but, you know, he offered himself to Israel. And there's that beautiful scripture where he says, you know, O Israel, O Israel, I would have longed to gather you like a mother hen would gather her chicks beneath her wings, but you did not want me. So no, he wasn't the king of the Jews in their hearts, even though he was the king of all kings. Israel rejected him. So again, it's a false accusation, but this was the criminal accusation above his head. In verse 27, it goes on to say, And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by uh, derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who were to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Uh, the Greek scholar Robinson talks about this word mar mar uh, mocking in Mark 15, 31. Uh, in, the in the Greek, it describes it like acting like silly children who love to mock one another. So this was... Uh, if, you, if you could picture this, these high priests, these, these people of high ranking authority and uh, of high stature in the city are prancing around like little kids taunting 
Jesus. This is how foolish they have become. They, they have reverted or, you know, they've went back to like a childlike state uh, and they're just mocking Jesus. And Jesus is described as hanging between two thieves here. And this is really important because as we walk through Jesus' life through the book of Mark, we've looked at certain prophecies that help us to understand this was the Messiah. Jesus was who he says he was. And so the reason he was hanging between two thieves was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 12. And it says, Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. So he had transgressors on both sides of him. And he was treated just as if he was one of them. And the chant was, Save yourself. Now, this could have all ended right here. In the other Gospels, we know uh, Jesus talks about how he could have called down legions of angels to bring him off the cross. Or, or you know, he could have called them down and he could have wiped out every man. And I always paint this picture. In the Old Testament, one angel came during the night and wiped out 180,000 men by himself. Now, legions are thousands of angels. He could have called down just the angels, not even used his power to destroy all mankind. But the fact is that if he did save himself, if he did pull himself off the cross, he could not have saved us. Why? Because the work was not done. It was not complete. So this is the understanding behind redemption. If Jesus did not die in our place, if that debt for our sins was not fully paid, we would still be owing. We wouldn't have been saved. You know, my first car was given to me by my dad, but my second car I actually purchased, and it was a 1989 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, and I loved it because it was still the metal body type, you know, before it was fiberglass, so it was a heavy car, it was a manly car, uh, you know, all these things, and this was in 1998, and so we didn't have a lot of the, you know, the e, th e kind of uh, online stuff to make payments with, so uh, from the bank, they handed me a little book that had all the payment slips inside of it, and for two years, I paid $100. $197 a month for that car. And I remember when I got to the end of that book, that 24th, you know, that receipt, you pull that out. It was such a, a wonderful sound to hear that rip, the, the, the perforated edges just tearing down like that. And it was to remind me this was the last payment. I don't, I, I don't owe anybody else anything on this car. It's actually mine. I owe it. And it was just a great feeling. But if I had missed just one of those receipts, if I got 23 out of 24, would that car be mine? No, I would have still owed on it. So the debt would still have not been paid off. Jesus could not just go most of the way to the cross. He couldn't just go halfway or three quarters way. He had to see it through because he had to repay the debt that we could not pay. That is redemption. He paid for every single ounce of wrath that God had intended for sin and for sinners so that we would never have to experience it as his followers. And so they cried or they crucified him for this. A theologian by the name of Edward says, Although the Romans did not invent crucifixion, they sure perfected it as a form of torture and capital punishment that was designed to produce a slow death with maximum pain and suffering. So when you think about crucifixion, it wasn't just the nails and the beatings and all these things that actually killed you. It was other things. Uh, so these were the top you know, five uh, things that would actually cause you to die during crucifixion. Uh, it would be acute shock from the blood loss. Your body would just go into shock and then you would die. Or you could suffocate because you were just too exhausted to breathe any longer. Your body just actually gave out. Dehydration, depending on how long you're up there. Uh, some guys could be there for hours, some guys could be there for days. Or because of your, the stress on your body, you could just have a heart attack. And the last one would be a heart rupture where you just have congestive heart failure because of the trauma that your body has gone through. Now think about that. They had become so good at what they did. The torture didn't kill you. The effects on your body is what took you out. So this picture of crucifixion is horrific, but it's a great visual of just how horrific sin must be in the sight of God, that He would choose a heinous way to require this kind of sacrifice on the behalf of sin. That should allow us to understand God takes sin seriously. It has a repercussion in our lives that we should not tolerate it, we should not look upon it with any acceptance whatsoever. Not love, those are two different things. Acceptance and love is two different things. We're to love sinners. We're to love them. But we have to proclaim the truth. Sin is sin. 
Or what else are we here for? Verse 32 goes on to say, Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So this is, this is the power of faith. The world's version of faith is, hey, show me this and then I will believe. And that's not the gospel. What the gospel is, is, you know, we are to believe. And then the Holy Spirit reveals to us after we believe the truth and we get to see it. That's why in John 20, 29, Jesus says to doubting Thomas after, you know, uh, Thomas was worried. He's like, we're, we're all alone. Christ has died. And then Christ actually rise, he, he, he rose from the dead. And Thomas is saying, look, I don't believe it's him. Even though I'd have to see him and put my hands in his nail holes that are in his, uh, his hands and his side. I want to I feel where the, the spear went in. And Jesus tells him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's us today. Why do we have that ability? Because of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of Him to reveal to us who Jesus is, the truth. So our faith comes from hearing the truth. It comes from hearing the gospel. And our faith continues to grow by the listening and the teaching of God's Word. Like we're doing tonight. I'm not proclaiming I'm going to teach you anything you haven't heard. But that's what Paul says over and over again. I want to remind you about the gospel. I want, to, I want to teach you what I've already taught you so God can work in your heart and God can grow you. The Holy Spirit will take that message and that word every single time and He will mature you. He will make you strong again. Uh, more like Jesus is the, is the goal. And that's Him doing it, not, not us. And this verse, it shows us the depravity of man. Not only did God give His Son, to Jesus, to die for us, but sinful mankind, sin in us, the sinful mankind, it enjoyed killing the Savior. You can see them mocking Him. But the cross is not the end. It's just the beginning of redemption of what Christ did for us. I love that song. You know, the moment that He died on the cross, He waged war on death, hell and the grave, and He was mightily victorious over it. Now these same high priests, this is the power of the gospel, how they mocked Jesus. On this day, they all mocked Him. They saw Him. They spit on Him. They jeered Him all the way to the cross. These same high priests, most of them would come to believe and experience the actual work of the Spirit in their lives. Acts chapter 6 verse 7 says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem in a great Many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, if that's not a picture of the gospel, I don't know what is. That these men who mocked him on this day got to experience complete forgiveness. And any of the gospel that preaches anything different than that Jesus can save anyone is foolishness. These are the guys who put him on the cross. That's the good news of the gospel. Verse 33 goes on to say, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, there was darkness just like in the book of Exodus, right before the angel of death came to uh, you know, fulfill the last plague on Egypt so that the Pharaoh would release them. Remember, we talked about how Jesus is that Passover lamb. This was very similar. Um, you know, at then the, the whole of Egypt became dark, and nobody knew what was going on. All I could hear was the screams of people that the plague was so bad. But here, you know, man didn't want to see what was happening on the cross. They didn't want to see the marvelous work that God was doing on our behalf of what Jesus was laying his life down. They didn't want to see it. So God removed their ability to even look upon it physically. He made it dark. If you don't want to see what I'm doing, that's not going to change what I do, but you're not going to look upon it and mock it anymore. So he makes the whole entire scene dark. And in verse 34 it goes, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now Mark's account of the crucifixion, it's brief compared to some of the other Gospels. But I believe the Holy Spirit, He's not, when He was giving Mark the words to pen, when He was writing these, I don't think He was looking to invoke just an emotional response to what's going on with Jesus. Because the cross is not 
The problem, the cross, is not the big burden right now for Jesus. The true sacrifice of Jesus was not his physical death on the cross. He's crying out in his actual original native Aramaic tongue, and the writer keeps it in this so to show the intensity of his pain at this moment, that this is the moment now that he cries out. Not, not the beating that happened at the courtyard, not carrying him, you know, being mocked through the streets, not the, the actual crucifixion itself, it's now he cries out because Jesus think about his ministry he didn't fear the storms when they were raging he said calm be still and they were still he didn't he didn't worry about touching the lepers that he would get leprosy he healed them he didn't worry about the demon possessed people he had power over the legions they had to bow and ask him permission to go places he didn't even fear the soldiers when they were demanding an answer from him or mocking him he was totally secure the agony though that rolled off Jesus' tongue when he said this the true terror of the cross was actually for him being out of fellowship with God the Father while all this was going on while that debt was paid. He had to become like us. We had to see Jesus be treated by the Father as we should have, so that way we can be treated by God the Father like Jesus after the fact. He was terrified of not having that relationship, even for a few short moments, from God the Father. In verse 35, it goes on to say, And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Now, Jesus was nearing his final breath here, the, the onlookers. Everybody could see it. Everybody knew he was right at that moment. So they offered him wine again. But this was not to take away Jesus' pain. This was not out of sympathy of what he was going on, but that it was to fulfill their sick curiosity. What they were doing here was they, they said, let's keep him alive just long enough to see if Elijah actually comes. They were being inhumane to him. And in verse 37, it goes on to say, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now at this moment... This is when we start to see the joy after the crucifixion. Just moments after Jesus gives his life and his breath is gone from his body. At this moment, everything changed for us on how we may approach God from here on out. Before this, the high priest is the only one who could walk behind this grand curtain and actually be in the presence of God and he would make sacrifices for us. Even then, the high priest walked in timidly. Because he was afraid that if I walked in unclean, if I didn't do the ceremony right, if I didn't do this, you know, these acts right, that I would be slain behind this curtain because I would be considered unclean in the presence of God. But now, God, I love that, from the top to the bottom, God from heaven himself ripped this uh, curtain all the way down, from the top down, God coming down to man, and allowed us to understand that the curtain that was torn physically, what God did on this day, at this very moment, is that he opened the that curtain for the rest of eternity. Even though the Jews went back and sewed it back up, that physical curtain could not hold him back. Jesus had opened us up to the act of grace that was here. This act of grace to allow us to come into the presence of God. It was free to us, but it was never cheap. Jesus, it cost him everything to purchase it for us, and he gave it back to us freely. So that now we can live as the writer of Hebrew declares in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence, not like the high priests who were afraid in the Old Testament of going in. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That only comes through Jesus. Verse 39 goes on to say, And when the centurion, so remember, the centurion who had been leading him on horseback all the way up to the cross, it says, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Now this is a great, glorious picture of the gospel. The centurion, now think about the scene. He's shrouded in darkness. 
He is next to death. There's three men who have just given their lives on the crosses for their criminal acts, and there's one that is innocent. And he, he says, wait a minute, out of these three that are called criminals, there's something different about this man in the middle. There's something different here. And in the midst of Jesus' death, he finds the light in the middle of the darkness. He finds ultimately life in front of death. And he's saying something is different about this guy. And he says, truly this was the Son of God. This was an innocent man that we put to death. John 19.30 talks about um, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, uh, when it says he breathed his last, the actual words that came out of his mouth was, it is finished. And in the Greek language, this is uh, telestestii. It means paid in full, these three words. It is finished. The debt that they owed is now paid. They do not have to pay it any longer. All they have to do is know and believe on me. And this cry out of it is finished, it was a cry of a winner. So if you can think of the, the Roman games and those things, when someone is to win an event, they would come out and this would be what they would cry out, it's finished, it's complete, it's paid. Jesus paid the full debt of sin that we owed and had finished the eternal, the eternal purpose of the cross. That that's always been the purpose of why Jesus came. Now, what I want to notice tonight uh, that's, that can apply to us, we know the story of the gospel, we know these things, but let's break it down to something that actually applies to us. Notice the centurion. Did he come to know the truth when Jesus got all cleaned back up again? When his ministry was restored? Or was he still broken on the cross, going through the torture and the pain? It's when he was on the cross it was the transparency and the faithfulness of Jesus through the darkness and the pain as he still reached out to God. He cried out to him, and the centurion saw it. In this, in Jesus' brokenness, in his pain, in his vulnerability, the centurion believed because no one would ever go through all of this and still reach out to God unless that relationship was real. There was actually a legitimate relationship between them. And as a church, as Christians, if we want to really reach others for Christ, we have to be vulnerable like this. We have to allow when we're going through the moments of disappointment, of pain, or even loss in our lives, that you know that's when we need to pay attention the most, that people are watching us. People are looking at us. And we need to stop faking it and thinking, letting everybody say, you know, we're okay. When we're really not, it's okay to be who we really are in that moment, to talk about it, to, you know, if we're questioning or hurting or we feel alone. That seems to be the theme tonight. In those moments, we cry out to God, and we sure better let other people see it. Our walk is not about perfection, but rather about pointing to God in every circumstance that happens in our life. When I lost my dad back in July, uh, when I was in that hospital in, in that town, uh, Sherry was with me. But, you know, I, I was able to be able to be a witness to more people during that time of pain and loss in my life than I've had in quite some time. It was a, it was a moment because, you know, my circumstances changed, yes. The pain was real. The loss was real. But my purpose in life did not change. And I got a chance to minister to others. And when the church grew in the book of Acts, it was not because of good programming, a great worship team, a great speaker, a great building. None of those things is what grew the church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves. You see how this is a personal response? What's the congregation's part in this? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, which is the word, and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul. So once there was this part in them that says, look, I need to be devoted to this. No matter what happens, um, you know, whether it comes storm, high water, whatever it is, I am devoted to what God is doing in my life and in this community, in this church. And if we'll be transparent, despite what others might think or even mock, like Jesus is being mocked. The power of Jesus in our life will be evident to others uh, that you know God will bring them to ask. Like the centurion who was looking upon Jesus. What's different about this guy in the middle? 
He's going through the exact same thing everybody else is, but there's something different about him. You know, I've talked about the prosperity gospel so many times, but, you know, when we're actually prospering, usually the outcome of that when people look upon us is they get jealous and envious. They want what we have if we're prospering. And I'm not saying that prospering is not a good thing. God, you know, He reigns on the just, the unjust, He gives. All those things, He gives good gifts. But what I'm talking about here is, if that's the only thing that we feel like we have to be in good standings to minister or to be effective, we're missing out on the bigger picture. People truly take notice when they see us navigate hard times while putting our trust in the Lord. That's huge. I'll finish with this verse. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Wow. Wait a minute, that just blows people's theology out of the way. You have to, wait a minute, you have to be able to go through what they have gone through to be able to minister to them. That's not what that scripture says. He says he comforts us in what we're going through so that we may be able to comfort them through anything they go through. That is how grace works because we understand how God comforts us in ours. Maybe theirs is different, but it's still the same comforter. So he can comfort us because... He endured this chapter tonight. He can comfort us because He went to the cross and He sympathizes with us because He took on everything that we owed as a debt and paid it in full. Let's bow our heads and pray.